Hello, my name is Malcolm Myers. I'm from AMH Test Systems, uh, and I want to talk about a simplified actor-based architecture using utilizing producer consumer loops and classes. It sounds very convoluted. Hopefully, it won't be uh, that way. Right, this is a lady I wanted to talk about. I've forgotten the hashtag. This is Gladys West, and uh, she did a great deal of work mathematically modeling the Earth. We think of the Earth as a sphere, but actually it's sort of a bladed sphere or a geoid. And she took account of things like the gravitational uh, tidal and other forces that give the Earth its geoid shape. And a lot of that work was used in generating the models for GPS. And she's also a member of the USAF Hall of Fame. Now, the reason I admire her, I suppose, is, you know, she's, uh, uh, her colour and her gender have probably worked against her. But the real reason is she invented GPS. And as a result, I'm not divorced. So thank you very much, Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, first thing I want to do is define an actor. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans think they defined actor. But it's, I'm taking it from the Latin for doer. So I want to define it as a piece of code that wholly performs a, a single function, I should put there. So, for example, a code that controls a power supply or monitors some temperatures or sets some relays or, well, you can think, you, you, you use it. But it's on its own, it's standalone, um, it's doing one thing and doing it well. So if I want to talk about where you are, uh, a complex task that you might be given if, um, if you're, yeah, uh, how a trip to McDonald's can help. A couple of people in the audience will know where I'm going with that. Classes, they're not as hard as you think. A top level class, a trip to the cinema, and why not? And finally, complete the task and a, a code demo. So, where are you? you maybe you're CLD, your LabVIEW Core 3 level, there or thereabouts. You can. can code a pro working producer consumer loop, you've got an understanding of queues, a basic understanding, and a basic understanding of user events, maybe. Um, and you can sort of make a medium-sized, small to medium-sized application. This is who that's aimed at. And what I hope you'll learn is how to use classes to your advantage, how a generic recipe can help, and how to create a complex application that's the usual readable, scalable, maintainable. So there you are, you've been used to programming a power supply or programming uh, some thermometers, or, and someone gives you that. So this is a chemical production system. I'll give you a quick run through that was given to me to program. So on the left and the right there, you've got a spool of what can only be described as little tea bags of chemicals. This is making something called peptides. And the spool goes from right to left, and the chemicals go from left to right. So there's, there's this mixture going on uh, constantly. And in the middle, you've got these four modules. And the modules add chemicals. They, um, uh, they um, sorry, I've got someone, I can hear someone. Uh, they, um, they add ultrasound to the chemical to fire the chemical process. And you're monitoring the system. You're monitoring the temperatures. You're monitoring the scales and how much fluid's being used. So in other words, that's quite a complex system. If you're sort of two or three years into your lab view life, that might seem quite daunting to get that all working because all the modules are completely independent. They don't, they don't talk to each other. They're, they're exactly the same, but they're just multiple versions of the same code. So that's the... So it comprises multiple independent blocks, so those modules in the middle. Uh, some are one per system, so there's a motor controller to move the tea bags. There's uh, a spool motor controller to keep the tension in the tea bags correct. You've got some data logging, you've got a read switch monitor. That's one per system. You've also got four modules, which each comprise a chemical balance monitor, a heater chiller controller, a chemical pump controller, a temperature monitor, an ultrasound uh, controller. So in total, you're talking about 40 total modules. I should call that actors, really. That should say actors, not modules. 40 independent systems that need to work together and that you need to control. So how would you go about that, doing that? What options do you have? Well, you could have one VI doing 40 things, and uh, I'm sure we've all seen code that's tried to do that. It's probably not the right way to go. I think there be dragons. Uh, you could have 40 VIs each doing one thing, and that sounds more sensible, but then you've got this task of trying to create 40 VIs, which is clearly a lot of work in itself. You could look towards something like the Actor Framework or DQMH or other uh, architectures that are out there. 
I've always liked the idea of actors, um, but I've always wanted to do my, I always prefer to do my own thing, just the way I am, I guess. Yeah. So where do we start? So we've got to make four TVIs, really, or multiple, you know, whatever number you happen to have to make. This is a book by a guy called Michael Gerber. I know a couple of you have read it. It's called The E-Myth. And uh, it was recommended to me by someone as when I was starting in business. And I've read it. And it is an interesting book. If you're in business, it's worth doing. But it's essentially the story of McDonald's. So, and really what it explains, excuse me, I'm going to have to grab a drink. My mouth is dry. It's essentially saying how McDonald's works on a standard operating procedure. Everything works to the manual. And I'm sure we've all heard jokes or made jokes about how, you know, People in McDonald's never move more than two metres from their workstation and everything's done by the book. But what it, that allows is it allows less skilled people to perform highly skilled tasks. So you don't have to be a chef to work in a McDonald's. You can be a 16-year-old and read the book and, and uh, follow the procedure and everything works. And, and Michael Gerber calls that predictable success. Now, uh, whether you uh, like McDonald's or not, you can't deny that it's actually an extremely successful company. So the thing with McDonald's is all the sandwiches that they make are the same. Oh, no, they're not. I hear you cry. Well, I think they are in the sense that you've got a bun, you've got a main filling, you've got a topping, a relish, and a wrapper. They all conform to that basic recipe. So they're all the same but different. So McDonald's is using classes, in a sense. Their top-level class is a sandwich. They just call it, that's their sandwich. But no, classes. Classes are advanced. They're difficult. You need to have done the training. You need to know about scope. You need to have read and understood the Gang of Four book. You need to understand design patterns before you use classes. Uh, hang on. Just pop that out there. Uh, you need to be able to say code to an interface, not an implementation. And you're supposed to know what that means. Uh, in other words, is guru status required? Well, our survey said, and the sound didn't go on. Never mind, there's supposed to be a sound there. Never mind. You don't need to be a guru to get this to work. You don't need to get a guru to, to make this work at all. <clears throat> Instead, what we're going to follow is the rules laid out by, the, the named after this guy, Vilfredo Perito. I'm sure you've heard of Perito analysis. It's basically the 80-20 rule, the idea that you can perform 80% of your tasks with only 20% of the knowledge. And that's really what I want to try and cover today with classes. So I believe there's only four things you need to know to make classes really work for you. And they are encapsulation, inheritance, overrides, and dynamic dispatch. You don't need to worry too much about it. If you want to learn scope and all those other things, that's great. But you don't actually need them to get started. So how does McDonald's work? So an order comes in, the grill team member follows a generic recipe, they choose which ingredients are required, and they substitute the specific ingredient, for example, the chicken burger, for the generic main filling as they go. So how does that relate to us? Well, we have a fixed set of operations for fixed ingredients, and we would call that encapsulation. They're all the same but different. We would call that inheritance. Selecting the right ingredients, those are our overrides. And finally, substituting as you go, that is dynamic dispatch. So, do we have a standard operating procedure for a LabVIEW actor? Well, really, any piece of LabVIEW code does three things. It initializes, you read something from an any file, you connect to your hardware, so that usually takes less than 1% of the time for the program. You run your code, that's sort of more than 98%. You're setting up your outputs, you're performing your I.O., you're analysing, you're logging data, you're sharing results. That's what it's doing 98% of the time and more. And finally, you close it down. So you close down your hardware, you write your results to, to you know, you write your settings to an any file and you, you quit. Those are the three things we want to look at. So just to summarise so far, McDonald's uses a successful formula. And we can copy that using classes. We can use encapsulation, inheritance, overrides, and dynamic dispatch to make our job easier. 
Next, I'm going to be how to create the application. So that's the first half of the presentation over. We're going to actually look at creating the application, writing some code. It's a bit wordy. There's lots of diagrams. The reason it's there is because if you come to use this in six months' time, you'll have forgotten this presentation. You should have the slides. It should at least give you a step-by-step -step process to go through. But don't panic. Uh, demo code is available. I'm going to make a little, or I have made a... Um, an application, and if you want to email me, I'm happy to give you the whole code. So in six months' time, when you come to use it, you actually got something to refer to, not just some slides. <clears throat> That's our system, the G-DevCombobulator. Uh, it is, it's just something I've made up. Problem with an international audience is someone will come to me and go, do you know what that means in Flemish, you pervert? Um, <laughs> so... so what we have is on the left-hand side, we've got some temperature monitors. In the middle, we've got four modules which are doing exactly the same thing. They've got a chemical pump and some chemical scales, so you know how much chemical you're using. And you've got a heater chiller unit, so that's uh, moderating the temperature. Okay? But they're the same, but they're independent of each other. One, two, and three, and four. And on the far side, you've got a data logger. So everything works to one data logger. So really, that is... That's a main VI and 18 actor VIs. But really, this is about scaling to any size you want. That's hopefully the beauty of this system. So what do we do? Well, first off, we create ourselves a blank project, and we create our top-level class. If you've never created a class before, that's all you do. My Right-click, my computer, new class. You give it a name. You fill in the paperwork. I won't go into that. That's a, a bit too detailed. But this is something you should learn. You then want to create your recipe. And the way we do that is we add something called dynamic dispatch VIs. So again, you right click on your top level class, you go new VI from dynamic dispatch template, and you pop up with a window like that. That's pretty much what you get. They actually have the error uh, cluster there, which I've taken away. Most of your top level class VIs are going to be exactly like that, completely empty. They're just abstract, they don't do anything. The only two real um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain which ones are different from that. Okay, so you've now got a top-level class. The only data member at this moment is a queue name. Everything in the system, every actor has to have a unique queue name for it to work properly. And they're quite wordy, but again, we'll come to that. Uh, so on the right-hand side there, you've got your class. You can see I've got my accessors for reading and writing the queue name. I've got initialize, read my init file, initial conditions, connect to my equipment, some run methods, things that I might want to do while it's running, and then the close, close, disconnect, and write to any file. So most of those are empty. So it really only takes you about 10 minutes to create that. And that is your recipe. That's what run looks like. So it does setup output, output, input, analyze input, broadcast your data, data log, error handling, and inline delay. So I mentioned that a couple of these VIs actually have some code in them, and it's the error handler and the inline delay. If you've got 40 while loops, we're going to be doing producer-consumer loops. If you've got 40 while loops all trying to run at the same time, you will know that you've got to have some weight lines in there just to stop the whole thing from, from uh, gobbling up all your processor time. So by default, the inline delay is 100 milliseconds. So every, every loop is paused for 100 milliseconds. There's also the error handler. If you put just generic deal with an error, write it to a file, um, then again, that's inherited by all your, bottom, your lower level classes. And so your error handling can be done in one place. So you know, it might be you'll write, to a, um, you'll write to a file called module one heater chiller, and uh, that'll log your errors for you. But there's a problem with that, and that is that, ah, oh, hang on. Oh, right, I can see what's happened. My, 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 um, Let's pop them there. Right. The problem with that is you're looking and you're going, well, hang on, you've got setup output and output, and then you've got input and analyze input. Hang on, isn't that going to be an inconsistency? Isn't there a problem there? Surely if I want an output, I just want an output. If I want an input, I just want an input. I don't, is that going to crash lab you? Do I have to make VIs for all of these, for all of my classes? So the thing is, is consistency inflexible? The best place to... Yeah, so the question is, is consistency inflexible? And the way we're going to... To do that is to uh, go to the cinema, why not? Grab yourself a bit of popcorn, sit back, and hopefully... Now, I didn't get any sound before. Hopefully, I can get some sound, because otherwise, it's going to be a bit boring. And hopefully, I've got myself an internet connection. Is that coming up? Nope. Uh, can I... 
how come I've not got a video feed? Oh, ah, maybe if I alt tab. Oh, that's going to be a bit sad. Is there any way to get this YouTube video up and, and with sound? I've got, I've got, I oh dear. Just drag it across. Sorry, how? No, just uh, drag the top and then just drag it across there. Oh, I see. All oh, right, okay. All right, hang on. Sorry, can we go back and just start that again? I can't down, see the down. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. I mean, it has got, uh, Anyway, not, not working quite as well as I'd hoped, but hopefully you can see, uh, just read the, read the um, subtitles there. It's from Dead Poets Society. Yeah, I'll tell you what would be easier, is if I... Okay, right, uh, now I need to come back. This is gonna be fun. How do I, uh, is that alt tab to, yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's from the Dead Poet Society. I'm sure many of you, or all of you probably have seen the film. And I always think that last line is the cleverest in the film. It's, um, it's Mr. Dalton saying that exercising the right not to walk. So what I want to tell you is you should exercise the right not to create an override. You saw all those, over, all those VIs there in the top level class. You do not need to create a copy of each of those VIs for every single one of your classes. So if it's an output, just stick to an output. If it's an input, stick to an input. What does that mean in real terms? This is how dynamic dispatch works. So that was our recipe. So we've got all those VIs there. That's the top level. Supposing we have a chemical pump um, controller that we've made a class for, and it's an output. So we set an analog, we calculate an analog output, and then we send it to a DACMX card and uh, set a voltage. So what LabVIEW sees when it loads run is that it's, it goes through and says, well, I've got a, an override for pump setup, so I'll put that there. Uh, I've got an override for output, I'll put that there. There's no override for input, there's no override for analy analyze input. Broadcast and data log have also been overridden, and the other two, well, they're, they're just copied from the top anyway. So what actually runs is uh, that. The, the, top, the middle two just get basically ignored, because they, they, they were doing nothing anyway. Now, I don't know if anyone from NI can confirm. I presume that when the uh, compiler gets to the code like that, it would just say there's doing nothing and ignore it. Would that be if you were creating an executable? I don't know. Anyway, the, the thing is, you're, you're not having to run that code. So consistency doesn't mean inflexibility. So we now look at what we're trying to create with all our classes. That's our class hierarchy. So we've got a top level class. We've got a launcher class on the left hand side there. Uh, and you've got in the middle you've got a DACMX, a Visa, TCP IP. Um, the, the module class is, is uh, I'll, I'll come to that one, and then data logging. So the DACMX and Visa and TCP are just different forms of communication. You could have DLL classes or whatever you want there. And at the bottom there, you've got your pump and your temperature, which are controlled by DACMX. You've got your scales, which is just off a, off a serial port, and you've got your heater chiller, which in this example is just 
on TCP IP. So the launcher class is just doing the housekeeping. It's launching VIs, it's launching modules, it's keeping tabs of subpanels, it's keeping tabs of queue names, but it's not, it's not actually doing any of the data logging for you. So the main, the, our main VI launches the top level modules. I suppose you could call them tier one modules. So that's, that's the temperature monitor, the data logger, and modules one, two, three, and four. And you can see there that it's just taking, everything's in a subpanel. I, I, I'll mention that later. Everything uh, has a subpanel with a name. So the subpanel for temperature monitor is called temperature monitor. So it's getting the name from the subpanel and it's sending that to the uh, uh, asynchronous call VI and you're sending in the queue name. So every VI that's called is given a unique queue name. And the module then launches a submodule. So these are the tier two VIs. So again, very similar thing, but this time what we're doing is we're taking the queue name uh, that's calling it, so it might be module one, putting a hyphen in there and then saying, well, we're, we're launching the heater chiller, for example, heater chiller controller. So you'll end up with a queue name that is module controller two, heater chiller controller. So quite long, but at least it's explaining things. And most importantly, you've got a class going in there because it is at this module level that you create your user events and you need to copy them into the, the sub-modules that are called. So we looked at the input and output classes. There's not much going on there, just your DACMX physical channel names, your visa resource names and IP addresses. So that's just a way of, of calling the same thing several times. You then have <clears throat> add some module classes. So we, we've talked about a chemical pump controller, well, that'll be a DACMX AO class. We've got chemical scales monitor, that'll be a comport, so visa. And we've got our heater chiller controller, which is TCP IP. And finally, we've got our temperature monitor and our data logger. So we create a class for each of those actors. It doesn't matter how many times we call them. We then go in and start creating our overrides. And the way we do that is, again, right-click on our class, new VI for override. You then get a, a little window pop-up, and it tells you the, the overrides you can write to or you can create. So, for instance, you might want to do connect, or you might want to do uh, initial conditions. So you just create the ones you want to. And up pops a window, you delete that middle VI, you put your code in there, and that is your override written. So now that our classes are done, now we can start to co code our producer-consumer loops. So the basic PC architecture is we have one producer-consumer loop VI per actor. So some are called once, like temperature monitor, and some are cloned. So like the heater chiller controller will be called four times. Each, each actor has to have a unique queue name. So it might be, uh, okay, module controller one heater chiller unit, module two heater, that sort of thing. So they're all unique. Each actor is in its own sub-panel then the sub-panel name is the name, same as the name of the VI, just to make life easy for you. It means then that the operator can interact with all the code from the user interface. So rather than having, uh, I mean, you obviously use tabs if you want to, but um, you are able to talk to the co code at several levels of operation. So that's just our standard producer-consumer loop. We've got, in, in the initial side there, we're, we're generating our user events, and we are... Um, uh, Generate registering for events in the top level. Um, we've got uh, a queue, tell, tell the producer consumer what, what its queue name is. Um, and then in the bottom, we just our standard operations. So we'll have initialize, run, and quit, and anything data, uh, any of the data um, that we want to change. And I'll show you this when I demo the code, hopefully. Now, we've got these, in this case, 18 modules. How do they talk to each other? At the moment, they're just all working in isolation. Well, queues can be used for one-to-one -one communication between modules. So if heater chiller wants to talk to data logger, it sends the data via a queue. If module wants to talk to um, um, the temperature monitor, it can do so via a queue. Within the modules, so the, the, the uh, heater chiller and the um, scales and the pump, they can share information using user events. You could use global variables, I guess, but I'm trying to avoid using global variables. You can't really use local variables, so we're using user events. So how do we do a remote in queue? This is hopefully stuff you know reasonably well. This is just a remote in queue VI I've made and I've used over the years. You 
obtain a queue, you give it the name, that's the important thing, so module one heater chiller, um, you enqueue your element and then you close the queue and that's the job done. So, you're sent, so you might use that to send data from a sub-module to the data logger. Using user events, sorry if people know how to do this, um, you declare all your user event types at the top level class. So that then any child class can inherit those and use them. So that's how you declare a user event at the module level. You choose your, your, your term, you create user event and you pop it into the wait user event uh, in, in the top level cluster. Why have I chosen to put a single double inside a cluster? I'll explain that a bit later on. It might seem superfluous, but it just works. When I'll, I'll again, again, I'll explain why. You then register for your dynamic events, and when you want to broadcast for a user event, let's say you want to tell the other modules what the weight is, you uh, generate a user event just like that. You give it a, uh, the user event reference, you give it a value, and that's it done. And then when you come to read that, it goes up to the producer loop in the module where it, that's receiving the data, and this is why I've used clusters for weight, is that for some reason, I don't know why, uh, somewhere within LabVIEW, if I, may, if I put weight inside a cluster, weight comes up on the left-hand side as a variable to be read. Okay? So let's have a quick... I've got 18 minutes left, that's good. Okay, let's have a quick look at the code, if I can. Oh, I've got, still got blooming YouTube going here. Oh. Crumbs. I can't get to it. Right, lab view. Is lab view coming up? Oh no, I've got to spin that over there. Can yeah. I just close it? Yeah, I need to close that window. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I should have had it as a as a. Sorry, if you drag that across now, that yeah. I can close it, can't I? I can't get the mouse. Right? It's all right. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, now I can't. Now I can't bloody see it, can I? <laughs> how can I? Yeah. How can I change that quickly? Is it F4 to change? Uh, Windows P. All oh, right. Okay. Duplicate. That's it. That's what I want. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I wanted first time, really. Uh, recent projects. <coughs> DJ of Khan, is that the right one? Right, there we go. There's our GDEV combobulator. So if I run that, you can see we've got some thermocouples on the left-hand side, and we're logging them on the left-hand side. Four modules that do exactly the same thing. You've got a chemical pump controller. You've got some chemical scales for measuring how much your fluid you're using. You've got heater chiller controllers. And um, the information is shared within modules. So, for instance, okay, so the temperature's here. TC1 goes to here, okay, and that's done with a queue. That then broadcasts it within the module. So it then... Uh, comes or actually it may be that that goes I can't remember how I've done it now um, but you've got that temperature and that temperature and that temperature are the same you don't really need the temperature up there it's just there to prove that you can share information between modules okay you've got the weight and a flow rate the flow rate is set there but it's not being used there because that is not on but as soon as I turn that on hopefully that flow rate goes to there you'll now see that the weight starts to drop because we're pumping and that weight is mirrored here so I can turn the mod, same with the module here. I've, I'm saying I want a target temperature of 10 degrees, so you can see my temperature is starting to come down. So I can do that eight times if I wanted to, or I could stop, I can control things at a module level, so I could turn both on and both off. And what I'll just quickly do is whilst, uh, let's set up a results file. Right, let's call that. <clears throat> results, there we go. And I'm going to start logging, okay? So at the moment, we've, we've, nothing's on. So if I 
now I've, I've already given you that I can start within a module, I can, sorry, start within a submodule. I can start within a module. This way I can start the whole system going at one go. So you can see all the temperatures start to change, all the weights start to change. And if I then stop that, I can turn them all off. I can log, stop logging, and I can quit. And if I just quickly bring up, The results file. So what we have now is loads and loads of data. So you've got a date and a time. Um, every so you can see the module one controller, chemical controller pump pump goes from off to on to off, and you can see the, how the weight changes. Um, it starts at 1992, goes down to 1. So in other words, you, you, you're logging tons and tons of data, which is probably what you want if you want uh, your system. OK, so what does that look like in code? Let's look at the project. Oh, I've got 14 minutes, great. So this is how I set stuff out. We've got all our classes. So our top-level class is as I showed earlier. We've got all our accessors, because it's now quite a... That's what it looks like. We've got a queue name, we've got a username, and all our user events, and also an any file path. Um, all the accessors for that and methods, we've got initialization methods, run methods, close methods, and user event methods. This is why there's no point in me just hoping you'll guess this because it'll take you forever to, to duplicate it. So this is why it's available to you. The launcher class, like I said, that's the housekeeping. So that's just opening VIs and closing VIs and keeping subpanels open and closed. Um, so the launcher does most of that work. So here we go. What's the, what's the subpanel array, subpanel references, queue names, that sort of thing, um, and the submodules. So launch module and launch submodule. All they change is insert and start VI. So that's the only override you need is to just because you're calling the the tier one modules and the tier two modules in a slightly different way. Um, DACMX, Visa, and TCIP. They're very basic. And then here we get to our actual doing classes. So for example, we've got the chemical pump controller and we that's going to tell us that we need a flow rate and whether we're, our pump is on or off. Um, we have, why is it, do we seem to be losing video quite a lot, don't we? Um, so, so you read and write your flow rates and read and write pumps. Um, we've got here are our overrides. So you can see that's a subset of the whole number of overrides, but they're the only ones we need. So for instance, there's nothing about input because the chemical pump controller is uh, an output. Um, if I just open, all right, so that's the, the module VIs is where the actual uh, producer consumer loops are. So if I just take a simple one, which is like the chemical pump controller, there's not a lot on the front panel because really we're only looking at that small part of it. But if you can see, we've got our class coming in. So that's giving us our user event data. We're registering for events. We're popping that user event data into the local class, which is a chemical pump class. If we look at our producer loop, there's not much going on here. You've got your user event for closing the loop. You've got temperature user event which is just reading the temperature. Um, flow rate, change your flow rate, so enqueue that into the consumer loop. Um, these are in the wrong order, really. Panel close should be higher up. Panel close, you know, someone presses the X. Um, and pump, turn the pump on and off. And down here, again, it's relatively simple. I'm, I'm trying to get away from great big huge lists of cases for producer consumer loops where you've got 20 or 30 things. It's hopefully very simple. And so you've got initialize, which is your top level initialize, run and quit. That's all, that's, that's doing all the donkey work for you. And then you've just got change the flow rate because that's responding to a user input or turn the pump on and off. But pretty much every VI looks like that. Okay, they're all producer consumer loops, generate a queue, register for user events, um, very few cases in the top and bottom loops. So hopefully they're simple to uh, read, they're simple to maintain. And like I say, they're all the same. They all look very, very similar. So it's all very familiar. It doesn't matter how many cases you've got. That uh, is pretty much the end of the demonstration of the code. Like I said, if you want a copy of this code, um, you're welcome to, because I'm sure it would be not really practical for you to remember all that I've just told you, uh, give you something to refer to. So what I want to talk about now, 10 minutes left, right, is advantages of classes. 
First of all, you've got encapsulation. It manages, that helps you keep your code neat and tidy. I did a project about five years ago that starts off neat and tidy, and then as things grow, you just have VIs starting to pop up everywhere, and you really lose track of where all your data and your methods are. Classes really, really help you keep things tidy. Inheritance, all your code has the same look and feel. They all react in a very, very similar way. The overrides, you supply the ingredients and Dynamic Dispatch, LabVIEW does the cooking. You don't have to decide which uh, override to call when. LabVIEW does all that for you. So it's doing a lot of the donkey work for you. Some of the other advantages. All your VIs are quite simple and look very similar, which clearly uh, is an advantage. You don't have to work around one, one architecture, basically. Your class recipe means that you know where to write and look for specific code. So if I said to you, I'm looking for... Um, oh, yeah, this is showing all my, the next slide as well, isn't it? Never mind. Um, your... If you said, right, I want to set up the output of my heater chiller controller, well, hopefully, that should be pretty easy to find. You go to your heater chiller controller class, you choose your out, set, set up output um, override, and that's it. All your code to do that is in there. It's in one place. If you want a new actor, well, you just create a new class, you pop up a new PC loop, you stick it in a new sub-panel, and away you go. Um, you can use the same recipe again and again and again. And if you use classic sub-panels, uh, you can... They, they uh, help with flexible UI design. You can make the frames disappear. So you could see all my frames there, but actually with a classic sub-panel, you can make those transparent, and it all looks like it's one VI, but actually you've got 20 or 30 VIs on your front panel, but the operator doesn't know that. Um, the other advantage is each PC loop can be independently tested. So if you're saying, I just want to, I just want to check the heater chiller. So it's a producer consumer loop, it acts on its own, it's autonomous. You can run tests with your heater chiller without having to run the whole uh, application. So, some gotchas then. What Excuse things me, can you... Sorry. All right. You're still getting the next slide as well. Never mind. So, what are some things that can go wrong? Firstly, you need to, some of your VIs will be called a lot of the time. So like run, for example, and inline delay. If, you're, if your code is operating in a sluggish manner, so if your inline delay is, say, 100 milliseconds, and you can see only updates every 400 milliseconds, guess what? Each VI is calling that. You need to create your uh, shared clones for, especially for the run VI and inline delay. But anything, any operation that's really taking you know, 10 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, you should have as a shared clone. So that's one thing. The second one is timing loops. Now that code on its own looks fine. You, um, that's just creating a thermocouple channel with a timing loop, great. The problem comes in when you say, well, I want four of those. You may wonder, why did I have all my thermocouples on one side rather than per module? I did it per module in a project and I could only ever get three channels up and I couldn't understand why. And the reason was the hardware, my uh, compact DAC or C Rio chassis, I can't remember which one it was, a compact DAC, only has space for three timing loops. Okay? So you need to look at the specification for the hardware you're using if you're going to use a lot of timing loops. Don't think you can just say, oh, I'll have 20 timing loops, because chances are your hardware won't support it. So you need to think a bit cleverly. So I'd had one timing loop for my, for my temperatures, and I farmed out the temperatures to the modules uh, using a queue. So those are two gotchas that, that might trip you up. So there's a saying, if all you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. My saying is, if you make every problem look like a nail, then all you need is a hammer. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make this so simple that you're using the same process time and again. So conclusions then. Complex systems don't need to be scary. Classes and consistent produce consumer loops allow for readable, scalable, and maintainable code. The fourth, there's only four things you need to learn about classes. Encapsulation, inheritance, dynamic dispatch, and overrides. That's it. You don't need to worry about uh, all the smaller uh, intricacies of um, classes. And hopefully that leads to predictable success, which is what we were hoping for at the start. That's it. Any questions? And that's my email address. If you, if you want the code, email me. I'll happily send you a copy. It's there, you know, it won't be absolutely perfect, but it, it's good enough for you to get a feel for things. Are there any questions at all? Nope. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. What's the decision behind your class hierarchy? Why do you structure it as you did? 
I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Why did you structure your class hierarchy as you did? Um, it just seemed to work in the sense that the top level I wanted to be my recipe for everything. It just does initialize, run, and close. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the launchers, which are doing a specific thing. They're not actually dealing with data. That's doing housekeeping. Most of my data stuff is uh, using either DACMX, TCP, or... So those are my hardware classes, if you like. So they all, they all come down in a tree. And then a data logger is just off to the side. Was there a specific thing you were wondering for how I'd done something? Yeah. Yes, but all I would then say is just create, just in, if, if you're, you know, let's say it's a power supply, for instance, um, I would just move it across and say I'm now inheriting from TCP IP rather than from DACMX, because all that's changing is the, the address that you're sending data to. So I have to say, I'm not a classes guru, and, and I, but I really like the idea of using classes. So I'm sure there are people here who may think, hang on, I've not quite done it right. All I can say is this has worked for me and it works extremely successfully, and I like it because it's very plug and play, it's all very similar, um, I know where stuff is, I can easily find out where things are going wrong, uh, I can test things independently, it, for me it has a lot of advice, and, and I can reuse it, because that recipe I'll use on the next project, and the one after that, and the one after that, and it'll all be the same. So it's, I'm trying to get away from that blank sheet of paper, what, where do I start um, scenario. But I'm happy to have a chat. If someone, if someone wants to explain that I'm using classes incorrectly or this is how it should be done, uh, please feel free to catch me afterwards. But if you feel that might be of use to you, then you're welcome to copy it. Um, you, have, you have to have some sort of state machine behind each actor. It may, want, it may need to react differently to the same input dependent on. Yeah, so that's where your member class. So, for instance, um, the pump, pump on or off. So, um, if, if the pump is. Uh, so, if pump is on or off, let's go to chemical. Uh, hang on, chemical pump controller. So I go to my run state, so clearly that's, the, so I go to my run, and I go set up my output, which one do I want, I'm on my chemical pump controller, it, it oh hang on, oh no, that was, that was the one that's, um, that's just, I, I think what, what I, um, heater chiller, that's a better one, because that actually does. <clears throat> set up output, heater chiller. Oh, there you go. So I'm taking my values and I'm determining whether the heater, chiller, heater or chiller should be on. So that's, that's where it's all happening. The states are done within the run, within the run uh, class. Does that answer the question or not really? Not really. Okay. So you send a message to an actor. Um, yeah. You want it to do something. Yeah. What it will do can depend on what state it is in at that moment when it receives that command. Well, uh, or or do you always assume that your actors are always ready to do whatever they're told? Because you've got a queue there that's, that's just going around. Most of the time, it's just going run, run, every 100 milliseconds. Sure, so, sure, sure. So, every time, so you send it a command, and then the next time it comes to run, it goes, actually, I need to change my pump setting. So I'll go to pump setting, and then I'll go back to run. Okay. 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 Because it's always in queuing, it's always in queuing run. So there's always a run in the queue. So all you would do is you insert a change your weight value or you insert change pump. It goes to that, it deals with that, and then it comes back to run. So it's always coming back to run. Whatever you 
Whatever external agent tells it to do something, internally it's always going around the run loop. Can it refuse to do what it has asked? Yeah, I'm sure. If you, if you coded it up, if, if, if it said, uh, so for instance, it says turn the pump on, it might go, well, is the power supply on? If the power supply is not on, then don't turn the pump on because it won't work. So yeah, you, you would need to put in the logic for that. But yes, like I said, this is a very simple, it's really, it's just an, an example of the framework. It's, it's not a, a fully functioning uh, application. You can spend loads of time adding in logic for letting stuff do stuff and, or not do stuff. So, okay, I think we're over time really, so I want to stop there. Thank you very much. If you want, to, if you want the code, let me know. If you want to have a chat about it afterwards, let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you.